Hello everyone. Oh, we're live and welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors Q&A for members or anyone else hanging out watching. I'm Joanna Penn. I'm here with Orna Ross. Hi Orna. Hi Joanna. Hi everyone. Here we are. It is October, late October, nearly Christmas. All the Christmas stuff is in the shops. And of course, we're all looking forward to bumper sales. We're coming up to the best time of year for book sales, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah, more, more books get sold in the next six weeks than for the rest of the year. So happy days, everyone. Let's, uh, <laughs> you know, shame we don't get the money till a bit later, but you know. <laughs> Right, let's um, let's get on with it. So uh, we start every month with a bit of an update. Now, since Orna missed last month, I was here with David, who was amazing. But Orna was at Nink and then at Frankfurt. So uh, what were the kind of highlights that people should know about those two conferences? Yeah, um, I'll have a, a written piece on this on the blog and on Monday next, uh, just all the, the various takeaways. But I think the outstanding theme from conferences and from, you know, generally just ear to the ground at the moment is that there is a shift happening um, whereby people are really beginning to look at um, publishing as a, a global endeavour. So, you know, really waking up to the fact that as an indie, you can publish everywhere in the world um, in English and also waking up to the potential of rights income in translation and other formats, you know, um, that might have traditionally been called subsidiary rights, but for an India are actually very central rights, like audio, for example. So um, at Nink in Florida, there was, um, run by Porter Anderson, a really good day called First Word, which it was six hours. We were on stage for six hours, all of us. It was a very unusual sort of setup in that way, and it was really good because uh, it was a real learning experience for me as well. I can't remember the last time I was at a conference where I learned so much. And um, people who really are, um, you know, looking at various different ways that we can reach out. And as Fortress said, it was very much about asking the right questions rather than coming up with all the answers. And we, we are at the early days of this, but I think, um, a lot of the Indies there, Nink is a great organisation and has lots in common with Ally and lo lots of their members are multi-published authors. I mean, one woman, <laughs> Casey, who organised conference has published, wait for it, 400 titles. <laughs> um, so, um, and there was everything from that down, you know, so a lot of them are people who did well in trade and now have, you know, unreservedly shifted to self-publishing because it's a much better deal for them. Um, so yeah, it, we had lots of, of really good talks about exclusivity versus spreading, going wide. And the uh, conclusion is very much that it is the people who are doing best are those who are going wide. Yeah. And I, you know, as I said to you before this, I've been talking about global for years and I'm so happy that everyone's catching up now. <laughs> well, absolutely. As I've, I mean, since the start, our line was very much be in as many formats as possible, you know, in as many places as possible, yeah. be anywhere your reader might be. And, you know, don't limit yourself to one. Now, having said that, you know, when you start, you when start you with the one, yeah. the one, we all know who we're talking about. Um, everybody starts with Amazon and Amazon's a fantastic platform. And, um, you know, it's not about that in any way. But as soon as you kind of have, have a few books under your belt, definitely it's making a lot more sense to, to extend out wider than that. And I met a number of Indies for the first time, actually, that I, I met a number of people who are selling significantly better on Apple iBooks than they are on Amazon. And a number of authors who had really, you know, got a kick with the whole change in, in the Amazon thing last year and mm. you know felt very bruised by that and were determined not to be reliant on one supplier going forward. So um, yeah, I suppose that was the big, the big message coming out of Florida. And then from Frankfurt, again, it was about global, just same idea, just from a different perspective, which is the selling rights perspective. And met a fantastic indie woman who had um, come to Frankfurt with her husband, set up a booth, and while she was there, sold rights to 40 different uh, language translations of her book, and she was over the moon, and that was just lovely, and a sense in Frankfurt, again, of, you know, no engagement with the author. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, 
apart from the, the you know the self publishing day that, that we were speaking at which was very again you know very much at the, the start or beginner level i took a picture of the author lounge it was uh, it was empty it was me and my camera <laughs> so you know a lot of work there for frankfurt to to sort of Mm. understand what's going on at that level but still interesting to see that indies were finding their niche and um, great to to meet up with matthias who's our german um advisor now and uh, hear his take on germany uh, he was also in florida actually and um lots of interesting things happening there and um you know there is no doubt that this is going to spread out across europe so that was the the news from frankfurt yeah oh, was, good. and i think it, it's it's hard well it, it hard to remember that this is still really the beginning like i say it's the toddling years of this shift yeah, this shift across in in make in the maker movement across all industries you know I mean we the music industry is kind of the forerunner I suppose but this maker movement is shifting everywhere you know 3, 3d printing is going to shift manufacturing into the into the home we're gonna you know we're seeing so many things where people are actually building their own stuff at home um, or in little groups and so it's not just self-publishing this is a, a, a creative movement across the whole world you know and and this will just continue to spread so I think we just have to see that this is only the beginning still only the beginning Beginning. and you know it's amazing Absolutely. really anyone who's publishing self-publishing now is still a pioneer mm. and and it is it is great and I suppose that's the other thing that you come away from these pu big publishing conferences realizing is that really we are a different tribe we're a different mm. you know we mm. think differently we operate from creative perspective rather than commercial of course we have commercial interest at heart as well but you know, creativity is is genuinely core to what we do. It's not mm. something that you just pay lip service to. It's and the way in which we think about books, the way in which we think about our reader, all of these things are drastically different. And as you say, we would have much more in common with artists, musicians, and so on, and the way they're reaching their audiences than we have with trade publishing and how it reaches its. Um, and we have some plans now for next year uh, with the three big publishing conferences, London. Uh, BEA and Frankfurt that we will have a separate indie stream you know the indie author fringe and we'll be launching that at um, probably the bookseller author day or sometime soon we'll be kind of talking about what we're going to do there because we really do need to carve out a separate niche and make sure that those times of the year that indies are getting what they need. Mm, yeah, and the, the different kind of strata is is needed too. New new people, and then you know what happens when you've got more than three books when you know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, that's that's cool. Um, well, I've been so I mentioned last time when you were away that I've been co-writing this this book, Risen Gods, my first co-writing. And uh, what we're going to do is actually also at the same time we're writing a book on co-writing. We're co-writing a novel and co-writing a non-fiction <laughs> on co-writing just for a laugh. <laughs> and this is again something that indies can do, right? We just because what we did as we wrote is every day we were leaving notes for each other. So we've got we've got twenty thousand words of correspondence on a big Google Doc that we're going to take excerpts like my complete paranoid fear that someone else was reading my first draft I think it's really good for people to realize that that we all feel that right I mean has anyone read your first draft I think it's amazing I think it's brilliant uh, you know uh, the idea that you would actually uh, plan it and map it it's actually something I am um, really as a personal thing it's my thing for next year is to a map what's going on because what's going on is so amazing and you know keeping record as you go it's such a mm. such a great thing to do and as you say there you are another book wow well it's not out yet <laughs> no but it's but we're in editing in editing but we decided to do another one so if people are interested in co-writing we're going to kind of show um that non-fiction side as well as producing the novel um also had a book out in spanish today profanacion uh in spanish which i was just you know saying to you beforehand i only loaded it up to amazon yesterday and now it's for sale i mean this is a magical world we're in right and i'm doing a 50 50 split with a lovely spanish translator uh and also an audiobook live today so again Again, multiple languages, multiple countries, multiple formats. This is what we're here for, basically, you know. And um, 
what else? So we were going to talk a bit about um, uh, a publishing update. So you've given a bit of a publishing update, but we've also had two author earnings reports. Uh, we had one fo quickly followed by another. Um, and the one I wanted to bring up uh, first is one that is probably the, the, the only thing you and I disagree on. <laughs> Well, like, oh, not ISBNs again. <laughs> yes, you know, everyone loves talking about ISBNs. And what the what the author earnings report said, October 2015, it actually had a look at Apple, Barnes & Noble, Kobo, Google Books, um, and found that 33% of all ebooks sold in the US each year have no ISBN, which, uh, before you start, is why the, um, the reports uh, that show that ebook sales are dropping, all of those reports come out of the AAP and do not count any books without an ISBN. And I, you know, as I've said before, I don't use ISBNs, um, so my sales aren't counted in there. And, you know, lots of people, Hugh Howie, for example, th these are a lot of people who whose sales aren't counted. So, um, what are, you know, one that's, um, you know, amazing, and that's why people shouldn't be discouraged by all of these news reports that say it's the sky is falling and, you know, ebooks are over. Um, but secondly, interestingly, do you think, um, are you still holding to your position on ISBNs? Oh, yeah, even more so. I mean, for the reasons that, you, you know, that, that you cite there, if we want to be part of, of an ecosystem, now I get it completely, listen, ISBNs. The second we, you know, we have a question about this on the forum. We do a blog about it. Nothing gets <laughs> indie authors more excited than ISBNs. <laughs> so, I just don't know why. <laughs> it's so interesting, and people have very, very strong opinions about yeah. it. And yeah, um, my my thing on it is is very simple. And and I think you know, as an organisation for indies, in twenty years' time the only way you'll be able to trace a particular format of a particular book you know if a library wants to order a book if a bookstore wants to order a book and a particular format of of a book uh, the isbn for the last 50 years has been the way in which people get to do that and the way in which you know libraries of congress libraries of record keep track of what's going on now i completely recognize we're in a in a new situation but i think it's a very small investment for um indies and it makes you the publisher of record and i think for that reason it's worth doing and so it's still our advice that people should buy their own isbns use a different one for each format and um, not one for every single type format one for an ebook one for an audiobook one for a print book and that means that anybody who wants to get your book will trace your book back to you the publisher rather than tracing it back to smashwords or create space or whoever there we go the word the official word <laughs> that I just ignore. <laughs> uh, but this is part of being indie. You're allowed to be independent and have your own opinion. So, absolutely, uh, you know, absolutely, and 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 people do, and away yeah. they go. But I think it's it's really interesting. Uh, that New York Times um, article about the, the death of the ebook or the sum of the ebook or whatever. It was such sloppy reporting, and it's you know it really is. Um, it's a shame that people are not looking a little bit beyond, you know, that, that uh, the paper of record again, New York Times can dismiss and not take Indies in is because Indies don't use ISBNs. If there were, if I, I everybody it's, did. It's different now. Doesn't um, um, Jeff Bezos own Wall Street Journal? And this is why the New York Times is going up against the Wall Street Journal. And that hence that big working at Amazon makes you want to commit suicide piece and all that type of thing. Like there's been a real shift in the media since that purchase. So, um, you know, I just think the whole thing, just everybody, when you when you hear this stuff, when you read it in the paper, just remember the vested interests of the parties and weigh up other information. Because I've just had so many emails from people really worried about these news articles saying that it's all over. And uh, it's not. <laughs> no, it really, really totally isn't. And that's why, again, we all owe a debt to the author earnings guys who are, yeah. are just fantastic. I thought that last report was the most interesting, you know, by a long shot. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. it's just absolutely fascinating and they're great. And what would we do without them? You know, we wouldn't have a clue what's going on. And it also makes 
you know, a bit of a nonsense of all the publishing magazines and everything that are saying they can't get to grips with what's going on in the indie space. Therefore, they won't report it at all. And yeah. we've been writing to people saying, you know, please put on your charts. You know, <laughs> these these are not represented. These represent conglomerate publishing only. You know, a great number of books were self-published this week, um, and also by by some, by small indie publishers, which are not accounted for in these charts because we've got bestseller charts going out there with um, trade published authors who are selling a fraction of, of um, what's being sold by indies. So it's all a mess, you know, yeah. and as you say, yeah, you got to, depends on what pair of glasses you're wearing as to what you see. Yeah, uh, I just want to correct myself. Jeff Bezos buys, bought the Washington Post. Okay. There we go, just so uh, I don't get sued or something. <laughs> 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 they're all we there say is an opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's an opinion. Listening to our Google Hangout. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, okay, so, um, and I thought this was a great uh, first question uh, from Suki. Uh, I feel overwhelmed with the amount of things I need to do as an author, i.e. blogging, marketing, building an author platform, and I'm still struggling to complete my first book. Should I first be focusing on producing the product and leave the other bits to later? What comes first? And I just wanted to say to Suki that I had one of those days today. I've just had a shocking day trying to do, I'm trying to move my email system and oh my goodness, I just wanted to just throw it all out and just say, I'm just not going to email anyone ever. <laughs> like email is disappearing from my business process. And like, I was, and I didn't do any writing today, which really annoyed me. Um, and it took much longer than I expected and we still haven't finished so I have to do it tomorrow so Suki I get you um, write the book <laughs> there you go. And, fi and figure out the, the rest later especially if you haven't ri written the first book yet uh, you know just get on with the book yeah I mean what comes first the book um, writing the book comes first definitely but perhaps maybe at the end of the day you know you could have a simple blog where you send out a little report or something of what you've done which can help to keep you honest and also you know and um, just kind of put it out there and get used to blogging and get used to documenting um you know i mean joanna you've been really fantastic at documenting your journey as you went along even when you were you know right back at the beginning you were actually keeping a, a good record of what you did and sending it out there and out of that you know developed your whole business wing which helps other authors and um, I think you know if you're completely overwhelmed and you're a one person at a time thing absolutely it's got to be the book but there will come a point at which you're going to have to think about how you're going to reach readers so maybe at least do that thinking about who your reader is and um, getting used to your genre, understanding where you fit in the book ecosystem, that kind of thing. If you're feeling overwhelmed, generally speaking, you know, you need to just take things down a notch. That doesn't mean that you drop everything. Uh, usually we're kind of pushing the edge. So mm -hmm. a step back might not mean dropping everything, but it might mean doing a little bit less. Um, yeah, and just to point out that I... I wrote and published my first book before I had anything online back in 2007 and the result of that was having 2,000 books in my living room and realizing that nobody knew who I was and I couldn't sell them and they ended up in the landfill. So what I would say now is at least finish the first draft. I think if you haven't finished a first draft, you don't even know what you're going to share online. So um, definitely finish the first draft and then while you're in editing mode, then you can maybe start to look at these other things. But as Orna said, it's, uh, you know, keep the balance. And like today, I just went, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I always forget about that first book of yours, actually. Yeah, yeah before, before you the creative pen. Before the creative pen, yeah. yeah. And which was the, of course, the big learner and the big turning yeah. point for you, yeah. Realisation that online marketing and finding your reader, you know, is for, you know, if your only goal is to just put a book in the world, don't bother. But if you actually want to sell some books, then you do have to do some of the other work as well. But... I think if you haven't even finished a first draft, you don't even know what you would even want to share, really, do you? Or what your even where the start of your voice is. Although both of us love blogging, a lot of people don't enjoy blogging, do they? So 
start a podcast <laughs> yeah I mean, there are so many things you can do and I, I do hold to the you know general guideline i'm not into overwhelm now the overwhelm is never a good place to be and i really urge everybody to step right back out of overwhelm either through you know practices that support you in terms of calming the inner space or whatever not into overwhelm but i am a, a sort of proponent of you can't start your reader outreach too soon and even if your audience does change your voice changes and so on you know, some people will go with you or whatever, but getting used to that, getting used to the dual nature of the job, I think from the start is a good thing because if you kind of, you know, go off into your your uh, garret, you know, to write and then you come out to publicize and then you have to go back in again to write, so much of what we do in this job is, and you know, made up as we go along and habits that we develop. So the earlier you can get the habit of actually reaching out, it's something that I struggle with because I think, because I kind of came of writing age at a time where you didn't do that, it's always, it's never easy for me to actually make that, that reach when it comes to my own writing, I can do it totally you know for ally stuff or anything to do with a day job but when it comes to my own um novels and poetry it doesn't come naturally to me because the way in which i write is to kind of you know hive myself off so i think you know it's, it is worth trying to move the two feet from the start if you can but yeah as i said never into overwhelm yeah uh, okay, Gail. Uh, firstly, Gail apologizes if this is a silly question. There is no, there are no silly questions. We're here to answer anything you like, and this isn't a silly question. Gail says, I've never written a book before, so I'm entering a completely new world, and welcome to our world. It's a fun one. <laughs> um, I plan to publish using both Ingram Spark and Create Space as suggested. I'm assuming both contracts for their print-on-demand service are pretty standard, otherwise people wouldn't be using them. However, I also know not to assume anything. Clever, Gail, absolutely. <laughs> My question is, should I have both contracts looked over by an independent lawyer to be certain I'm not signing something I wish I hadn't or can't get out of? Uh, however, uh, well, it'd be nice to have peace of mind, but it would be also nice not to spend the $750 to $1,300 I've been quoted by two lawyers. So this is basically the standard Ingram Spark and Create Space contracts should you get independent advice. Um, there's no need to, is the short answer. Helen Sedwick, who is Ally's legal advisor and has also written a, a cracking good book called The Self-Publishing Handbook and is working with me at the moment on another book about um, selling and publishing rights. She's already done this work for you. Um, so she has looked at the contract and broken it down and told you what to look at and explained what's going on there. So just to say that for self-publishing contracts it's a little bit unusual I mean I would say 90% of Indies just just go yeah. on and do it and never look at the contract <laughs> and there is the reason for that is if you don't go with Amazon if you don't go with you know I mean what we've done in Ally is tried to recommend um, you know what Joanna does what what lots of, of authors who've been around in this space for and um, some time do is recommend what we come to see as best practice and there's a remarkable um, agreement around that as Joanna said the only thing I think we disagree on is ISBNs and, and you know and I think that's true all around the indie track people pretty much agree what is best practice and the reason there is not really a lot of point in getting a lawyer to look at the create space in the Ingram contract is if you decided that you didn't like something in there then your choice is quite simply not to do it because there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> so, you know, there's nowhere else that, that will give you as good terms as you have there. And I mean, this is what we're facing with, with the suppliers that we're working with. We're always trying to get them to Im improve their terms. But in a way, you know, a lot of, a lot of what's going on in this space 
there isn't a lot of competition. So short answer is have a look at Helen's book where she actually breaks down the contracts and and see have a look and see what you see there. And then your decision is, do I go ahead or do I not? If you don't go with Great Space or Ingram, don't be fooled into thinking that you're going with a different service and mm -hmm. they'll talk about, you know, your book getting into Amazon, your book getting into the bookstores. They will be using the same platforms uh, to get you there as you would be using yourself but with far less money going in your direction and you would lose your control so um yeah anything yeah to... so uh, well just that helen's book is the self-publishers legal handbook very important I'm... to put the word legal in there because, yeah Helen's... yes there is another book yes yeah. <laughs> there's loads okay. of like self-publishing handbooks but uh helen's is specifically legal handbook and it's very very good and that's helen sedwick Dot com or you can find her book pretty much everywhere and she is amazing so um and really helpful so if you have any legal questions helen is the person to go to and uh, she's on yeah. the facebook forum also if you had a specific issue around the contract and you wanted to raise that on the forum where people you know we could actually get into the discussion of specific terms or whatever that would be great mm. uh okay so um well, you, you mentioned there about there not being uh, much option to go with other services. So that kind of leads into a question about from Jewel about what are people's experiences with ACX and what is the ally perspective on the pros and cons of the different options for getting it done within the service? Uh, and as I said, I just had another audio today. Deviance is out in audio. I use the 50-50 royalty split. Um, and it's a seven year contract and I go exclusive. So that's the highest royalty rates, but I'm locked in and it's an exclusive deal. Now, generally we would all say, don't go exclusive. You know, I'm really hardcore, you know, not KDP select on for, for my business. Um, but uh, this is, there, well, one, there is no other option that allows a 50-50 royalty split where they do the 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 money transfer and that to me is amazing and i want that for translation as well because i have to go through and do it all myself otherwise so and the they have the distribution and i mean certainly in the uk you see buses with audible on the side they're all they're really really pushing audio here now i know that we have authors everywhere else in the world other than the us and the uk are the only people who can use acx um but i really think that as Amazon pushes Audible out. Certainly, I think Australia, Canada, I can't see why, and Germany, I can't see why they wouldn't be pushing that out as the markets grow. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm still happy with ACX, but it would be great to see um, somebody else put something out there. Um, but the only people it could be would be Apple with iTunes. I, nobody else has the distribution. Um, but certainly if iTunes or Apple offered something, it would be a real game changer, I think. But, in the, you know, at the moment, I'm really happy making some money with audiobooks that I wasn't making otherwise. That's my personal view. What's the um, ally view? Yeah, um, ACX is a great service. There's no doubt about that. And, um, you know, it is, it can, it can be highly recommended in terms of how it manages the business end of it and how it, you know, the standards that it looks for, for audio and, and all of that. And, and that link in with Audible, you know, as you say, there really isn't any other option. So um, while generally our thing is yeah don't sign exclusive contracts i completely understand why people go go exclusive with acx like yourself would love to hear an announcement from apple to hear but you know we never we never know what apple is doing until apple does it so we don't even know if that's in in the can um or sorry in the works or, or whatever it would be great if it was um so in short if you want to do an audiobook um then i think you know it is the best service there without a doubt you need to be careful um it's really really important in terms of choosing your narrator that you know you know what you're doing and you take your time and you don't rush into it and 
we've had you know lots of stories of people who feel that they they jumped the gun and you know took somebody and they weren't happy with it it's expensive audio whatever way you do it you know uh, you're investing a lot of time a lot of effort if if not a lot of money and then we have a number of people who prefer to pay up front and you know pay pay the narrator and and they're making a long-term investment. Yeah. Um, and yeah, but audio is, I think, really interesting for indies because there's definitely, this is one of the things that was kind of surfacing at the conferences that it is very different for audio and indies um, compared to audio in trade. Audio in trade publishing was very much a subsidiary right. And it was a right that, you know, a trade publisher generally tried to kind of get in, into your contract and it didn't pay particularly well to the author and most books did not get the audiobook treatment. Mm. So you had to do really well in print before you would be considered for audio. Then, you know, in trade, it's kind of print first, ebook second, and audio is one of the many subsidiary rights. I think there's an argument for saying that for indies, it's possibly ebooks first, audio second in terms of return. And um, just because you do have that very nice um, distribution kind of arrangement between Amazon and Audible, that, mm. and the you know the, the bookstore distribution on print for most indies, not everybody, but for most indies on POD is still not. Um, you know, very very few people are making any money in print, but quite a few of our members are doing very well on audio. So there is the initial expense up front, but you know once you've cleared that, you're getting a, a nice you know a nice sizable royalty for each audio book. Um, as opposed to print, if you're trying to keep your print cost within the range of a trade published book, then your royalty is very low. So um, I think there's possibly an argument for saying you look first, audio look second, print third. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I, no, I disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you know I've been doing a lot of audio, and boy, is it yeah, it's really hard work. Um, whether or whether you do it yourself, as I've narrated myself. Uh, or you go with a, a, a narrator. It's also pretty hard to market. Um, so yeah, um, I think yeah, I I really like it, and I um, my sales are eighty six percent ebook of my income. Eighty six percent comes from ebooks, seven percent from audio, and seven percent from print. Okay. So they're equal, um, which means I'm happy to have them. But print's so much easier. And I think people care about print a lot more. Um, but I would say that what is definitely coming this uh, Christmas and ne into next year is um, Google Auto and Apple CarPlay uh, streaming audio in all new cars. And also I've been seeing on the tech forums, because I'm a techie futurist, uh, how, to, how people are going to be able to change their existing cars to having Apple CarPlay and Google Auto. So, which is essentially, you know, people right now are, get, are taking their smartphones and plugging them into Bluetooth into their in their car. This will be like having a smartphone in the dashboard of your car, so you can stop reading your, you know, start reading your ebook over breakfast, and then you get in the car and it will start playing um, from where it was. So I think it'll be interesting. Actually, another bit of publishing news we didn't mention was the Google settlement over the Google Book Scanning project. Big news: a ten-year. Uh, suit that's run has found uh, no no legal uh, what the terms there is no legal issue about Google scanning books so I'm wondering if will this take the brakes off Google and books you know with Google Auto coming in they could do something like um, you know with with Apple and with Audible where you know Whisper Sync they would be the only other people who could do something like Whisper Sync where you stop reading your ebook and then the audio book starts up at the same time you know so what do you think about that or the, the Google book settlement thing yeah it was interesting um, it was outrage in, in certain quarters and uh, I, I I think it was a very interesting judgment and um, really didn't know which way it was it was going to go. So I think we don't know the implications mm. of this one for a long time, actually. I, you know, I think it's it is a huge thing. So I mean Google's project is basically just, you know, to get every book on earth ever that was ever printed and mm. scanned in and up. And you know, what does that do to to writers is there are two very very heated conflicting points of view around that so um it'll be interesting to see how it unfolds mm. 
it, it will be very interesting to see how it links in with play and whether, whether you know, play, I mean, nobody knows what's going on there for, for ages and they've been shut to new writers wanting to use the platform. There are lots of, um, we, we don't actually, we haven't as yet included it as a supplier you should go directly to because it's the whole mess constantly with pricing issues. So, it would be interesting to see if, if that's all going to get tidied up now. Maybe they were waiting for this or, mm. or whatever. It has to feed in in some way, I think. So we'll yeah. be keeping, keeping a, a, an EDI on Google definitely over the next year. Yeah, I, 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 that's what's so interesting. I mean, there's so many changes to so many things. I mean, we've just seen also, like we talked about the EU VAT law, which came in in December, digital, you know, digital sales now would have VAT on and in the, in the country of the customer as opposed to the country of the vendor. We've now since uh, this last week seen a whole load more countries introduce this VAT uh, not called not VAT in other countries, like you know, a, a tax on digital sales. And I've been again in the tech forums reading that you know this is going to massively affect the sales of internet products across the board. Uh, and it's but but countries are realizing how much revenue they're missing out on with these international sales. So this is inevitable. Whichever country you're in, this kind of um, you know all these platforms are going to have to deal with these international because it's not territorial anymore. Like the publishing industry runs on these territories. We're not territorial. We can literally sell anywhere in the world. But we then we have to take the. The, the you know we have to pay the taxes we ha you know we have to do the things that mean we can sell globally you know in the right way and not to freak anyone out because of course all the platforms are dealing with that tax for us but it still comes out of our revenue so it's that we're in this flux around you know things as ever and the only constant is change in our industry <laughs> that's for sure uh, I think uh, one of the things with the tax issue is that Generally speaking, indies are pricing their books too low. Mm. I don't think the you know the proper level of the cost of actually creating that book is built into the price of ebooks generally. Um, another interesting finding from um, a conference season was that a number of the um, non-Amazon platforms, particularly Kobo um, and Apple, uh, on both of those platforms, you can price significantly higher without it mm. affecting your or sales and I, I really would encourage indies to think about their pricing 99 and free 99 cent and free are you know useful um, promotional tools but the you know the perma 99 cent book is is something that you know, it's not realistic in terms of even you know take the taxes out of that and take that it couldn't possibly pay no matter how many you're selling um, you know, so I, I, I think I would urge Indus, yeah, to think about pricing and realistically costing what the book has actually cost in terms of putting it together. Cool. Uh, okay, uh, two more questions. Uh, Sam says, what are the pitfalls when, mar when, sorry, what are the pitfalls when publishing a second edition of a currently published novel Create space and KDP, and at what point should the first edition be taken out of circulation? Now, I was really weirded out by this because for me, I've done second editions of nonfiction because you know how to market a book, things change, and I'm probably going to do a third edition. You, we do you do the Alliance of Independent Authors books second edition. Why would you do a second edition of a novel if you're just fixing typos and things? Why would you do a second edition? Am I missing something? Well, the only thing I can think of is that maybe, and this does happen, that um, the writer was very unhappy with what they put out first. So, you know, it's it's not unusual for writers to jump the gun and to, to publish before a book is ready. And perhaps you feel that you need to take that book away and bring out a second edition. You don't. You just keep the same. You can just up up grade your file so again i suspect this might be a previously trade published author or an author who's familiar with how trade publishing works which and print books which is you know 
you had a second edition because essentially you ran off the first edition on a printing press and then to to oh, make okay. changes you had to set up a second edition um, and had to be so labeled because uh, with a new ISBN so that the book trade would know this is the second edition and not the first edition all of that is now changed because it's print on demand you don't need to do that so I'm guessing and again come back to us you know and refine the question if, if I have it's wrong but I'm guessing that that's what, what you're thinking about so you think if you're making major changes that you need it to be a second edition you don't you just need to kind of get rid of the, the one that you don't want it to be and upgrade your file basically um, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah and and if it's a case that the first novel like it went up and you got loads of bad reviews then just unpublish that's what I, I mean, and I'm going to have to do it at Nook again. The Nook format, I'm having a massive Nook formatting pain and I'm just going to unpublish again and then republish because the, all the re reviews you get about formatting, you know, I'm just going to start again and Nook, the reviews are, you know, barely there anyway. And, and obviously you don't do that on Amazon because you lose everything. But if you want to lose everything, then that's the way to do it is unpublish completely and do it again. And you'll get a new ASIN, which is the Amazon number. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love our little needling. Um, but um, in terms of doing a second edition, so um, because I've had a debate with David Gochran about this, um, because we both did our a second edition similar time, you have a choice uh, because some people like how to market a book about 20% of the book was different. So um, I chose to overwrite the file and change the cover to second edition and put a text on the blurb which says second edition but that means that the people who had already bought it didn't necessarily get notified that there were changes now you can get amazon to notify people and they will download a new version of the book but um, other people upload an entirely new edition as a separate book entirely the problem there is you don't get your sales history you don't get your reviews even though it's essentially the same book so I will probably, when, when I do the third edition, I will, I again will just upload it again. Um, and that's probably what I will do. And then just say to people who've bought it, you can always email me and I'll send you a free copy or whatever. Um, so that's my opinion. And But that's kind of with nonfiction. I think there's a lot more. But just remember, you know, if you're not used to doing this, we all upload new files all the time. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a kind of regular event, especially if you're... Um, you know, putting out new books, you update your back matter, you might update what your your uh, email list giveaway is, you might find a typo, um, you know, you might, there are just, like the, the file, the, the book I just uploaded yesterday, Profanation, I uploaded in the full knowledge that we would have to make some changes that I'll probably do tomorrow, but I wanted to just get it, get it rolling, um, and then I'll upload another file with, with some changes before we start marketing. So it's not a big deal. Um, you just have to, and that's when you do the formatting yourself, it's not a big deal. It's a bigger deal if you pay somebody else. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, it is a very big deal if you come from a trade publishing perspective where a new edition or a librarian perspective or a bookseller ah. perspective or, you know, where people like it to be neat and tidy and that was the first edition, this is the second. This is a very different world. So yeah, just um, enjoy the freedom. Yeah. And it's kind of also like the, you know, the Wayback Machine. People should, you know, if you don't know that, you can look at, oh, it's the internet at a different point. So you can look at my website, The Creative Pen on the Wayback Machine, and you'll see how awful it was back in 2008. It's something that makes you feel really good. And it's also quite like I've got a whole um, box full of my, you know, books that are not for sale anymore, um, books that I've printed. And now, you know, the first edition of Pentecost, which doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> you know, this, this stuff is good to keep copies of it. But you can overwrite it, so you know that's good. Uh, okay, last question. Um, Lucy says, I've marketed my book, a fantasy thriller, in an identical way in the UK and the USA, and yet have had virtually no sales in the US, although reasonable sales in the UK. Can you shed any light on this? Is the US market a much harder nut to crack? 
Well, generally speaking, uh, you know, speaking generally, and, and you can't for an individual experience in writing and publishing, um, generally speaking, no. Um, the USA is not, um, it's not unusual for people to do best in the US, regardless of where they, they live in the world, simply by virtue of the fact that there are more ebook readers there and so on. The kind of thing you're talking about, though, happens all the time. And there is still a great mystery about publishing, reading and writing, you know, I mean, the way we do things makes it much more possible to be more strategic about it, to reach a reader in a much more deliberate way and to, you know, to plan the book and market it in a certain way and, and to have some confidence that your efforts are having a certain output and to test that and so on but still things happen for which there is no explanation um, I would I would feel if you are having no sales at all in the US and and you know I'd, I'd love to hear more about your marketing strategy in each place I'd like to know more about the book and you know what the genre is and everything before I could actually comment on whether the marketing is having an effect if you know if there's something there that you're just not seeing that clearly marks it as a non-USA book because one thing about um, US readers is that they you know they can actually be turned off a book unless they're the kind of person who's, who's actually seeking to read about a different culture a different time and place mm. or whatever they can actually be turned off by a book if they clearly see that it isn't um, US so we have lots of members who though they're based in the UK, use US spellings in their texts and so on. And um, yeah, so over to you. Uh, oh, well, I'm just, um, I just look, looked up Lucy and um, the, what it would, uh, doesn't look like a specifically British cover. Um, you are British, Lucy. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, just by personal connection, you will start selling in the country you live in just because your friends start helping and that starts the algorithms and blah 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 so that is one start the other thing I would say is the um what I did way back and it, it paid dividends I mean probably 75% of my income is from the US and also 75% of my traffic to my websites the US and I did that deliberately when I was living in Australia um, at the time I deliberately scheduled everything in the time zone of America so I would always schedule my social media posts in American time, and I still do. I schedule the three time zones as well as a European one, but I very much, con and then I networked specifically with American bloggers, American writers, um, you know, ended up then obviously once I got a bit more money going to American conferences, listened to American podcasts, got to know the names of people over there, and I absolutely think that was the way that I started selling things in, in America um, as somebody who wasn't in America at all. And in fact, so lots of people think I am American until they hear my voice because I have a much bigger profile over there than I do here. So I think that's something to consider is if you, you know, whatever you're doing for marketing, start scheduling things within that time zone. Um, because often, like for the American social media, like now is a good time to start. And no, who's going to be up at 1 a.m.? I'm not, like, you know, on doing things on Facebook and stuff. So scheduling stuff can really, really help when you're a British author or in any other country trying to reach another time zone, basically. Oh, the other thing I would say, Lucy, is, you know, like everybody, you only have, you know, not like everybody, like, like many new authors, you only have one book. And it's very hard to sell one book anyway. So I would, um, when you have presumably a couple more in the series, because you've got, a, I think it looks very nice. Um, you know, there's the George R. R. Martin audience. Um, you know, you just, once you have a few more books, it's going to be much, much easier to market in general. And then you can do things like put the book on, the first book on perma-free. You could do um, some free promotions. You could do some paid promotions. You know, there are lots of things you can do to get to reach those readers. Um, lots of, uh, you know, that type of thing. So hang in there. <laughs> I'm just looking. I think, yeah, it was only published in March this year. So yeah, hopefully you'll have another book out next year. <laughs> I think that makes people feel better. Sometimes I know everyone, and I remember feeling it, oh, those idiots who tell me that I just have to write another book. They're just being idiots, but it's actually true. <laughs> oh, we've had loads of people who said, oh, I used to get so annoyed when you'd say that. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, and it is really annoying, and I'm really sorry, but 
there's no way around it <laughs> Yeah, I think it's part of, you know, the standard is going up. Uh, there was a time where to write a book was a, was seen as a really amazing thing to have done. Nobody think of, thinks that's amazing anymore. Writing a book, you know, publishing a book now, it's it's relatively easy mm. um, to do that. And there is this sort of thing, you know, the, the, the more people are doing and the better people are doing it, everybody's kind of upping their game. And so it is becoming much more um, difficult to make a mark and to, you know, to make, to be noticed and to market and to, to reach the readers. There's no doubt about that. Um, but yeah, three books makes a big, big difference and five yeah. makes a huge difference. We're always saying that. But yeah. It's, it's um, true, you know, true. I thought I was doing well with, with 15, but then, you know, you meet the, the people who've written, what, 400? 400. <laughs> Seriously scary. And That's quite um, crazy. That, but, that, you know, Isaac Asimov did that, but in a in a lifetime. Enid Blyton. Barbara Cartland wrote 800, I think. You yeah. know, no, no one would say that Barbara was, you know, literary fiction, though. <laughs> no, I d they don't tend to be literary fiction when you write uh, that many of them. But uh, And this was not a, um, a young lady she'd been writing for many many years but um she had taken a year out to be part or, or some years out perhaps to be part of the Nink committee and was now so looking forward to going back and writing another book and I just found that really fabulous that she was as buzzed and as excited about going off to write the next book 400 mm -hmm. and something as she was back in the day when she wrote her first few so um yeah, yeah. and I, th I think it only gets better too I mean I've I've, I've got a list here I, I, I may mean to get four books out by Christmas <laughs> But well, most of them are already in a certain stage of readiness. It's just getting them like that finishing energy, mm. um, which I know sometimes you struggle with too. You know, it's just that, just get the, you know, the push through the difficult bits and, you know, but I think that that's both the wonderful thing and the difficult thing is, like you said, it's not that special anymore, but it's still special to you if you're writing your first book. Obviously, we totally get that writing your first book is amazing and very special and you've done a great job. And if that's where you're happy to stop, then brilliant. But if you want to sell copies and you want to be an, uh, like an author, a professional author, uh, somebody who writes for a living, then yeah, one is, one is just the beginning of your journey. <laughs> <laughs> and if you get the bug, oh my goodness, we've got the bug, haven't we? On <laughs> <laughs> yep, bitten. <laughs> totally bitten, can't stop. And it's like super fun. And, and going back to what Suki said and my having a bad day and everything, you know, that's when you have to just step back and like tomorrow I'm just, you know, I'm put, blocking out my time and just doing some writing first thing so I can feel like I've achieved something and then I will get on with the rest of the the stuff later and when I had a day job because obviously most people have a day job I would get do my creative stuff before work so I get up at five and write before work and then in the evening I would do my marketing so again that separation but you know it's fun if it's, you're not having fun do something else <laughs> definitely if you're not having fun it's hard work it's too, too much like hard work not to be having fun doing it <laughs> exactly you've got to at least enjoy some of it okay so we're uh, done any last uh, last words orna are you up to anything this month um in terms of well yeah the, we have the got some conferences yeah some final nobody cares con about that final <laughs> conferences to um thank you joanna <laughs> <laughs> they're all uk uk based things <laughs> yeah there are two um that to finish off and then um we have the choosing a self-publishing um service the 2016 yeah is going up um in a week or so's time i'm working on this rights book as well and um, getting that ship shape and um, i'll see helen in san francisco in february and we hope to jointly launch that there but we'll be we're pulling in lots of information from our members who are already selling in other countries. So we'll be also letting that out as blog posts as we go. So, um, mm. yeah, that's the allied plan. Sounds good. I just saw in my diary that I'm going to see Elizabeth Gilbert speak and uh, her, new, her latest book, Big Magic. Yes, I've read it, yeah. I thought it was really good. I think the word magic is wrong. I think it should be mystery or something like that. But because mm. um, magic has connotations for, for some people. So it's not actually about magic, like in the 
sorcery sense, but I thought it was a very, very good book. Um, so I'm going to her, hear her speak. So did you did you enjoy it? Yeah, I read an awful lot of books about creativity, mm. and um, I the thing that made the book worth the price for me, and I bought it in hardback, um, was the last story about the the Balinese. I thought that was just a, a beautiful oh, story. Yeah. She's a great storyteller, mm. um, and she's you know. She's um, she's really got an ability to kind of hone in on um, the gleaming detail that sort of conveys mm. a principle, and I think she does that very well in this book. Yeah. yeah. So if you need some uh, inspiration this month, read Big Magic, um, and we'll be back on the uh, Tuesday, twenty fourth of November for our last Q and A of the year. Yeah, because we skipped December because we're you know really lazy around Christmas Day. <laughs> because you lot are all lazy around Christmas Day. <laughs> and yes. we'd be here talking to ourselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that would be fun. So um, let us know your questions and we're always happy to answer anything at any level of publishing. There are no silly questions. So thank you again, Orna, and thanks to everyone for listening and um, we'll see you next month on the Alliance of Independent Authors Q&A. Thanks, Joe. Bye, everyone. Bye.